Okay, good evening. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, hope you can all hear me. My name is Julie Conn. Um, I'm the coordinator for NET Education um, to all the events and speakers that we have here at NET Israel. Um, we're very honoured to have Mindy here with us tonight, Mindy Wiesenberg. Um, the title of her talk is A Time to Break, A Time to Heal, and A Time to Build. And this talk is going to be it's like kind of the next in our series of talks about mental health that we've had in the last few months or so. Um, I'm going to first explain the format. So the talk will be, um, Mindy's talk will be about 45 minutes. Um, and then we're aiming to finish around nine, between nine and 9.15, depending on how many questions we have or discussion points afterwards. Um, I'll just say a little, uh, um, if I can ask you all first of all to mute yourselves. I think Neil's going to mute everybody once Mindy starts speaking. And then if you have any questions, Mindy has requested that um, you don't ask during the talk, but leave it till afterwards if that's okay. Um, and if you can try and just put the questions in the chat, if you have a question that kind of you want to type up straight away as you think about it, please put it in the chat and try and put it just to me if possible, if you don't mind, and then I will sift through them at the end of Mindy's talk. So just to say um, something about our lovely speaker tonight, um, Mindy was born and brought up in London, the daughter of a Holocaust survivor and a kinder transport refugee. She spent a gap year in Israel on the Bnei Kiva Hashara scheme um, and then did a bachelor's degree in geography, a subject she then taught at secondary school level for a number of years. She then did a master's, later on did a master's degree in Jewish studies. Um, Following this, she um, spent about 40 years um, being involved and fundraising for British Emuna and became the UK chairman, uh, or chairperson, I should say nowadays, in 2003, a position she held for four years. She still serves on the British Emuna executive. Um, unfortunately, she was diagnosed with cancer in 2012 um, and spent many years undergoing grueling treatments. Um, after her husband suddenly and unexpectedly died three and a half years ago, she began to put together some of the thoughts she had, um, sort of to do um, mental thoughts and psychological thoughts, dealing with her illness and also the bereavement and the grief associated with it, and how she used um, different methods to help herself heal and just move forward with her life. Um, this eventually became her book, which I have here in front of me. You can get it on Amazon. Um, Healing Pathways, A Journey Through Life's Challenges. Um, the book explores many pathways. Um, there are sort of 10 chapters in total um, that helped her manage her healing, such as finding wellness within illness, learning to grieve, awakening to awe or fear, cultivating gratitude and turning thoughts into reality. So all these are topics that we all, I think, kind of struggle with and, and day to day with, with all of the challenges that we each have. Um, all of these have helped to move forward with hope and resilience. And we will hear about all of these ideas tonight. Um, Mindy is a, um, and her husband, um, I love a shalom, we're best to have four children three of whom live unmarried and live in Israel together with her grandchildren. Very much, Mindy, over to you. Thank you so much, Julia, for introducing me uh, and indeed suggesting to the NAIR committee that I speak tonight. Uh, thanks also to Louise and to Neil for all your help with putting the event together and of course to the NAIR Yisrael for hosting me. Um, it's lovely to see many of my NAIR friends here tonight, especially as I'm 3,000 miles away in Israel at the moment, and apologies in, in advance if I have to stifle a yawn because it's gone 10 p.m. out here. Um, some of you may recognize the title for this talk as a quote from Kohelet, but actually not placed in the correct order, as I want to begin with a time to break and then talk about healing and rebuilding. Now, last year, as the implications of the corona pandemic spread, like millions of people around the globe, I was wondering, how am I going to get through this? In a sense, knowing that millions of people around the world were going through the same thing was both a comforting and an overwhelming thought. 
Often when we face challenges in our lives, it's the loneliness of our experience that can make it all the more painful. But today we have the benefit of knowing that every single human being has experienced similar sensations to us over these past 18 months. Yes, each person faced different varieties of challenge, but there was something unique in the experience of all of us battling an uncertain future. It is this notion of uncertainty that I think was the most engulfing for so many of us. There are many professionals, religious leaders, psychologists, scientists, etc., that will have a unique advice on how to grapple with these challenges, uh, but I don't profess to be any of these. I was just a person who gained courage through my life's battles that cultivated not a theory of living, but a, live, a life lived with illness and bereavement. And that gave me a perspective on how to get through those experiences and try to heal myself. And that's what I've been writing about in my book throughout the last year. And I'm going to discuss with you some of the ideas in the hope that they can offer some kind of framework to help heal after the brokenness that the mental and physical effects of corona have left on us. And so to begin with a time to break. The period where we are now in the three weeks is a time when we tend to focus solely on destruction, a time to break, commemorating the destruction of the Bet Mikdash, the period of being Ben Hametzarin, between the straits in narrow places. How can we find a widening from our narrow space? But first and foremost, we're called upon to mourn the destruction, to live in the moment of destruction, to mourn, to cry, to recall the ideal, the temple, the imminency of Hashem's presence, the sacrificial duties that represented the immediacy of our relationship with God. But then we're also called upon to recall the story of what happened after the destruction of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and Vespasian of his request for Yavne rather than Yerushalayim, a type of compromise for the ideal. And what resulted from that compromise, the flourishing of the Torah Shabbat of Her, the oral law, which was a call for greater human involvement in the covenant and a greater social responsibility to the other, of the beauty of what was created in the exile, of nursing our hopes and dreams of return to the land. All of this and more was a re resultant feature of our ability to make space for brokenness not allow it to overwhelm us, to be broken, but to find the ability to heal from within. The temple was an externalization of God's presence. We brought, brought sacrifices there. We were called upon, we saw the Kohen Haggadol and the Avodah, but when the temple is destroyed, we are asked to make a Mikdash Me'at, a small temple within our homes, within our Bate Knesset, and even more profoundly within our hearts. In a radical way, the rabbis call upon us to move from the divine presence, from externalities of sacrificial duties to the internalization of prayer and kavanah in our actions. One of the themes that runs throughout my book is the move, this move, from the external to the internal. And here, at the point of healing, we see it at its most profound. Healing comes when you take from the external brokenness, internalize, process a situation, and find the inner strength to face the external crisis, which in turn will help you to heal and build a better future. That is what my book focuses on. But before we get to that part, it's important for those of you who don't know my story, to give you a bit of a brief outline. Nine and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with lymphoma. And although I didn't need immediate treatment, within two years, I had to have my spleen removed and had started on chemotherapy. Unfortunately, within months of each new treatment, my cancer returned. And eventually I had to undergo a stem cell transplant, which we hoped would cure my cancer once and for all. But unfortunately, this too didn't work. And within a year, my cancer had returned. I then had a top up after the transplant, which gave me a period of remission. And then my husband and I took a well needed holiday in Israel three and a half years ago. But while we were there, 
my husband Johnny contracted pneumonia and two weeks later suddenly and totally unexpectedly died. Months later, my cancer returned. Yet I was extremely fortunate to be able to access some groundbreaking treatment in America, which managed to give me a remission. However, last November, the cancer resurfaced in my thyroid, which then had to be removed. Baruch Hashem, my latest tests now show that at the moment things are stable. But over the years, the enormous amount of treatments, procedures, heart-wrenching decisions, secondary infections, hospital stays and complications, and then losing my life partner of 40 years, these were all part of a very challenging journey. Coping with illness and then bereavement changed my whole perspective on life as my future plans were dashed. These fractures in my life left me broken in many ways as I experienced years of dealing with uncertainty, isolation, the puncturing of future dreams, and then loneliness having to go forward without my husband by my side and so many other difficult situations. The mounting losses in my life as a result of my health concerns and my husband's death made me realize that I had to try every way I could to heal myself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Over the past 18 months, as the pandemic spread, I recognized that so many people were experiencing fractures in their lives from serious illness or could be the death of loved ones and to the loss of so many of our activities which define our lives. Smachot were canceled, holidays, theater trips, schools were disrupted. The entire framework of our daily lives was interrupted. We had been so used to having control over every aspect of our lives and the ability to go and do anything at the drop of the hat. But when those expectations were no longer met, there was a sense of fragility and vulnerability. This included when our loss of future plans led to so many things that we suffered from as our dreams of what could have been. Learning to cope with loss and fractures in your life, you need to grieve over those losses. For grief is the process by which you internalize your losses and then you can begin to heal. By internalizing, you're acknowledging your losses and this allows you to feel the many emotions that come with that. You accept that you are vulnerable and that is not easy. That takes courage. Courage is something that very often we don't know we possess until the circumstances arise that call for it. When you internalize that grief, you acknowledge that loss, you allow yourself to not just be broken, but to be broken open. And that starts to make space for building and healing. A very famous Kubler-Ross cycle of grief. This is a very well-known five stages of grief which are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. I have to say that I went through all of these stages, but not in necessarily that prescribed order, because it's important to understand that these are descriptive and not prescriptive. When you look back now, if I look back at the times that we have gone through, if you have a chance to think about what you've been experiencing in the past 18 months, I'm sure many of these emotions have surfaced at some point or other. We've all had different levels of grief. We're carrying it around with us. It's not something you can always see when you meet someone. Some of us may have had suffered from losses of lives of friends or family. Some have had made losses of jobs or income, loss of holidays and many other things. It's different for each person. Now, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to read Edith Eager's excellent book called The Choice. She was a Holocaust survivor who went through Auschwitz and managed to rebuild her life afterwards, becoming a psychotherapist. If any of you haven't read the book, I strongly advise you do buy it called The Choice. She says there's no hierarchy to suffering. There's nothing that makes my pain worse or better than yours. People used to say to her, Things in my life are pretty hard now, but I have no right to complain, it's not Auschwitz. And she got very upset by this, where she said, this kind of comparison, it leads you to minimize 
or diminish your own suffering. And you have to acknowledge that suffering. There's another very important writer who talks about grief. And I write about all these authors that I quote are at the back of my book because I use, went through a lot of their books to give me advice. David Kessler writes on grief and he talks about finding meaning as a sixth stage to the grief process. He says the pain you feel over your losses is inevitable, but the suffering is optional. We often believe that grief will diminish in time, but it's not grief that needs to diminish. We have to grow bigger. We have to be the architects of our lives after loss. They say that time is a great healer, but it's actually what you do with that time. That is the key. And so from brokenness, moving on to time to heal. Trying to heal from the fractures and losses in my life led me to search for what could heal me physically through medical answers with the latest treatments for my lymphoma and mentally, emotionally, and spiritually for what could heal my mind and my soul. This led me to research meditation methods and understanding how the mind works. One of the most important things I came to understand from both reading and experience was that the emotions control human behavior and it's not human behavior that controls the emotions. And I'd like to ask Neil, if you could screen share the first slide if possible, which shows the two main groups of emotions. And this now comes from two columns here. You've got one of love, all the emotions of love on one side and all the emotions of fear on the other side. All the emotions of love include things like gratitude, joy, acceptance, forgiveness, kindness, admiration, hope, freedom, blessing, peace. These, all these emotions can be grouped under love. On the other side are the emotions of fear hatred, anger, jealousy, anxiety, judgment, depression, sadness, worry, vulnerability, all these emotions are grouped under the heading of fear. And it's important to understand emotions of love that we experience raise the energy levels in the body and emotions of fear create stresses in the mind and the body and they deplete energy in the body. But just talking about emotions isn't enough. You need to feel them really deep down inside. You need to internalize them. And one of the ways this is done is by intention. Neil, you can stop screen sharing for now. Okay, the Hebrew word for intention is kavanah. And perhaps this has always been associated with tefillah. But it's really important to recognize that any mitzvah, or indeed any action we undertake, if it's carried out with deep intention, it is this intention which directs the energy in the body. If the intention is made with love, then it will raise the energetic level in the body and its surroundings, creating what I suppose you could call good karma. But if the intention is made through fear, this creates negative energy. That's why stress, anger, frustration, and so many of the associated emotions of fear that we experience during isolation depleted our energy resources. Internalizing our thoughts or our emotions highlights a very important mechanism, and that is how our hearts and brains are connected. One aspect of self-isolation was that it gave many of us an opportunity for self-reflection, connecting our inner selves trying to understand what we wanted from our lives. You might think that being in isolation engenders separation, but you can view it differently. For as self-reflection turns you inwards, you can actually begin to understand the wisdom that resides inside your soul, your neshama. This is your guiding force or intuition. And through it, it's important to realize that we are in fact connected in a very deep sense with everyone and everything in this world through waves of energy. Now, this is part of a whole field of quantum physics, which I'm not gonna go into now, 
but it's important to understand that we cannot see this connection for it's just like our mobile phone signals, our radio and television signals, where they are transmitted, but we cannot actually see them, but it's there. Those connections of energy between us as individuals is an enormous amount of healing energy that can pass through those connections if we allow ourselves to open up towards it. Just think about a radio signal. You need to have a transmitter and you need to have a receiver in order to complete the signal, otherwise it doesn't work. Opening yourself up to receiving the love and the energy that is coming towards you from others allows the circuit to be completed. Just think about why to healing groups are initiated to pray for those who need healing. Think about all the coincidences in your life that you feel are just coincidences, but so often they are invisible connections through thought and emotion. And that energetic power is there. And we can tap into it by linking our intentions or thoughts with our emotions. Now, I want to place these two very powerful energetic emotions of love and fear in the context of the three weeks. Many of our sages elucidate the fact that the destruction of the Bet Middash came through sinat khinam, baseless hatred. Hatred is an emotion of fear. Healing and rebuilding can come through the opposite. Love and all the emotions associated with it. I'm not, I'm not an Ababacha. I, can you, I, can somebody, somebody, Cheryl, Tannen, uh, the mute the mute. Myself here, hold on one second. I don't know if everybody can hear me. I'm unmuted. Okay, fine. That's fine. Okay. One minute, I've just got to just check. I had to check my microphone was unmuted. Okay, let me go back to saying Sinat Chinam came through the reason for the destruction of the Bet Midgash, baseless hatred. Hatred is an emotion of fear. Healing and rebuilding can come through the opposite, love and all the emotions associated with it. Now, look, I'm not a Lubavitcher Rebbe by, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but I have huge admiration for the late Lubavitcher Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson. His whole paradigm is rebuilding the world through Ahavat Chinam, unconditional love. This is what he showed to everyone with his whole network around the world of Chabad and Lubavitch. Building the world as an antidote to Sinat Chinam through Ahavat Chinam. And as we talked about, the opposite of all the emotions of fear are emotions of love. Now, I have to say that the power of love to me, there have many stories I could tell you about this, but I'm going to talk to you about my stem stem cell transplant. When I had my stem 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 transplant, I had to go through horrendous chemotherapy beforehand and the after effects were horrendous. But the actual transplant itself is a very straightforward process. You lie in bed and you're wired up just like as if you're having a blood transfusion. And I was lying in the room and my daughter was with me. And at that time, I knew around the world there were groups of people saying to heal him to me. And I cannot tell you that there was an amazing sense of calmness that came over me as I sensed something coming in towards me, those emotions, that energy of love through the Tehillim from everybody around the world, it actually came, I, I felt something internalized that calmed me down and throughout that entire process, which lasted for a couple of hours. And that was an amazing, I have other stories, but I'm, I haven't got much time tonight to tell you. I have other stories that can also tell you about how these emotions of love can be transmitted if you open yourself up to them. There now have been many scientific studies that have shown about the energy of love as it's felt deeply as an emotion, the positive effects it has on the body because emotions of love raise the energy level and improve the immune system. And the new science of epigenetics, which studies how genes in the body can be changed by external forces, 
have shown that the telomeres at the end of genes are lengthened and improved through the experiencing emotions of life. We can overcome the emotions of fear by cultivating emotions of love. There's a very famous saying, you can't heal what you can't feel and the emotions are at the root of it. We often think our heart is our emotional center, but the brain is the place where our thoughts originate from. Yet the latest science has shown that in fact, in the hearts, we have over 40,000 neurites, which are actually brain cells in the heart. These can think and remember independently from neurons in the brain. We're conditioned to see the world through our brain, yet there's a need to connect with our hearts. We can process information very quickly by accessing this heart intuition, as we don't go through the logic and fear that resides in the brain. We can communicate in the language of the subconscious, and this is where healing begins in our bodies. Studies have shown that connecting the thoughts of our brains with the emotion of our heart through a deep intention can generate a specific healing frequency. Now, heart wisdom was something that was so much a part of the ancient world and so many of the ancient religions, including Judaism. But it seems something that has got lost in the West as the world became more secular and medical advances took away things to the from the spiritual world. When the Tanakh was first translated into Greek, the word lev was meant to translate it as heart. Yet in Western thought, this was seen as a separate organ from the brain, which was a thinking organ. Yet in the Tanakh, if you actually look at it, there was no such dichotomy. For the heart and its emotions were understood as a part of the human process of thought and reason. Just think of the number of times it's written in the Torah and in our tefillot, et Hashem You should love your God with all your heart and soul. We recite every day in Aleinu, et ki Hashem hu Elohim. You should know this day and take to your heart that Hashem is the only God. It does not say you'll know this through your brain, but rather through your heart. For this is not just an emotional command, but one of understanding that the heart and the soul have their own wisdom. And this turning inwards to listen to the wisdom of your heart has an enormous healing effect by taking that wisdom, processing it, and externalizing it to the choices you make in life and how you interact with others. With any choices you make in life, you need to ask yourself, am I doing this from a place of love or out of fear? For example, if you have friends who ask you to join them for an evening out together, do you decide to go because you love their company? Or is it because you're suffering from FOMO and you fear you'll miss out by not going? When you take up a new job, is this because you love the work and that particular company or because you're worried about being unemployed? You have to examine what your motives are for the choices that you make. The more your choices are made with love, the more, <clears throat> sorry, the more your choices are made with an intention of love, the more you hone your inner intuition and develop greater connection. The more you make them out of fear, the more you're using your survival instincts. And with these are negative intentions, which are less intuitive and less connected. If you're constantly living in fear, it lowers your energy, giving little room for any form of healing. To overcome fear and indeed any vulnerability, the first step is to acknowledge that it exists within you. And then you have to try and relinquish, let it go. You have to let go of the emotions of fear the best way you can. By trying to work on yourself and cultivate the emotions of love, this can help you overcome fear. Learning to love yourself is a gateway to open yourself up to love others. And this becomes a circle where through acts of chesed that you give to others, you begin to nurture a deeper respect and love for yourself. Do not underestimate the healing effect on the body that cultivating emotions of love and relinquishing emotions of fear can engender. 
but it's important to understand one thing. Relinquishing doesn't mean denying. It means acknowledging those emotions, but then letting go of them. So bearing all this in mind, how do you go forward and rebuild after the many months of isolation that has left so many of us feeling depressed and in a state of inertia? And I want to begin this section with a short idea that my daughter Tanya spoke about in a presentation we did last year. One of the most poignant narratives in Bereshit is when kind sacrifice is lifted and his brother Hevel's is not. Sorry, kind sacrifice is not lifted and his brother Hevel's is. I mustn't muddle this up. Hevel falls, uh, kind falls on his face, despondent and angry that his privileged life has been usurped by a moment of rejection. God turns round to him and without explaining or justifying the reasons for his rejections, simply says these words. If you can make good, you will be lifted or lift others. If not, sin will always crouch at your door. It's a strange verse and one that invites many in interpretation, but it can be understood as the first lesson God gives to mankind in overcoming adversity. It's the easiest lesson, but the absolute hardest to fulfill. It's the greatest test to us as human beings. No situation is perfect. No person, no life, no job, no marriage, no country, no government, no world. But how do we begin to change? We begin by changing our attitude. If we make good, if we can begin to see the joy, the goodness, the awe in any situation, then we can lift ourselves and others through our positive outlook and actions. For me personally, this has been the greatest challenge and one that I struggle with every day. I have learned over the years about adversity and living with uncertainty. And I try to tell myself every day that message God gave to Kind make good of a bad situation. But that means we need to make space for the breaking, the healing, and the building. And that requires first and foremost to stop searching for answers externally and begin to search for the answer internally to make good from within. For so many of us, COVID caused great anxiety and uncertainty and coming out from the pandemic is probably one of the biggest challenges at the moment. Can we make good of a situation none of us have chosen and one where God is not coming down to tell us what or why? I think my closing statement earlier discussing a time to heal is profound and important. Not to deny the fear and brokenness, to, but to relinquish its claim on you. Just as Elsa sang in the film Frozen, let it go. Let it go. Coming back to the three weeks, we begin with Shiva Osavatamas, commemorating the day that Moshe broke the Luchot. And there's a very poignant Agadah that tells us that the broken Luchot sat in the Aron with the second whole ones. Only once we make space for brokenness, for non-ideal living, can we embrace our reality and live fully and holy. How we build wholeness from brokenness, living with the non-ideal, living with corona, we have to embrace our reality. Over the years of the challenges with my illness and then bereavement, I learned to find joy and life even in the brokenness. When we were sitting shiver for my husband, Johnny, which was really a very difficult and sad time, some people had commented that they'd never been to such a lighthearted, happy shiver because at the end of the day, the shiver was just filled with love and laughter as we reminisced over Johnny's life and the wonderful years that we shared together as a family with so many friends. This taught us that even in the most broken situation, there can be a very small window of light. In the depths of sorrow, you can still have the capacity for rekindling joy. And this can be seen in so many narratives in the Torah. The ability to rebuild from trauma, 
This is the story of our Jewish nation. Building can begin by taking back control of your situation. One of the key issues during the Corona pandemic was that feeling of powerlessness and loss of hope. We must all realize that we cannot control our fate, what happens to us, but what we can control is our reaction to it. And that is the attitude we take in facing the challenges presented to us. Attitude is all. And one of the most important ways to cultivate the right attitude is feeling and expressing gratitude. An attitude of gratitude can work miracles. Now, gratitude comes from counting your blessings, and this can stimulate the hypothalamus, which controls the hormones in our body. I practice gratitude meditation every day. You say moda ani, and then I do my gratitude meditation. There are so many ways of counting your blessings. One very easy, quick way is at the end of each day, just write down three things positive that you are grateful for that day. The kids didn't have a temper tantrums. Your boss complimented you at work. You got a job done which had been hanging over you for ages. Three small things. I guarantee you, if you keep that diary and you do it for three weeks continually every day, your whole attitude to your life will change. Now, as I said before, I'm a great believer in meditation and I have had done lots of different types of meditation which have helped me. One of the key issues in meditation is breathing, practicing deep breathing. And what's very interesting is that if you, there is a connection with deep breathing, which takes you inside to your soul. If you look at the Hebrew word for breathe to breathe is lin shom, and the Hebrew word for soul, neshama, they each have the same three root letters, nin, nun, shin, and mem, which I believe it's not coincidental because through deep breathing, you connect to your inner neshama. And that helps you to rebuild from any trauma you have, that internalization of transformation. There are other areas which can help to heal you. And I go through many of them in my book, Forgiveness for yourself and others, living with a sense of awe and joy, humor, rekindling that joy. There are, as I talk about many of these things in my book, but I want to give you one final analogy. We started with the destruction of the Beit Mikdash and the period of the three weeks. And we're now moving in after Tammuz into Elul. And of course, I shouldn't be thinking about it now, but we're very close to Tishri and the Yomim Naroyim. Now the Yomim Naroyim are usually translated as the days of awe. But awe is a very interesting word because it's a contronym and it actually has one word with two completely opposite meanings. When we stand before Hashem on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we are always thought to be standing in fear, in fear of judgment, that awe, days of awe as days of judgment before Hashem. But there is another translation to awe, and that is of wonder and amazement. Awe as wonder and amazement is an emotion of love. Awe as judgment and trepidation is an emotion of fear. And we should now go in as we move on towards the Yomim Naroyim with this understanding that we are in front of Hashem, not in awe of judgment, but we should be in awe of him through love, of wonder and love of God. And it's your attitude, how you see things. Again, Neil, can I ask you to share the second slide, please? Because this, I want to show you a two pictures which will give you an explanation of how you one image can be seen in two different ways. One situation can have two explanations, two different ways. On the left, you see the very famous Rubens vase. You can either see that in black as a vase or in white as the profile of two faces. Look at the diagram on the right. 
Some of you may see this as an old woman looking down, and some of you may see this as a young woman looking away. Again, one diagram, one image, one thing in your life, one issue that can be seen in two different ways. It's your attitude which will determine how you see things. And thank you, Neil, for sharing that. We can go back now. I want to quote, give you a quote. I've got two quotes to finish my talk now. There was a very a special guy called Jeff Foster who suffered terribly from depression, went through many episodes, eventually came out of it. And he now talks about the amazing things in life that can bring you through difficult times. And this is a quote from his book. Life will eventually bring you to your knees. Either you'll be on your knees cursing the universe and begging for a different life, or you'll be brought to your knees by gratitude and awe, deeply embracing the life you have, too overwhelmed by the beauty of it all to stand or even to speak. Either way, they are the same knees. None of what I have discussed today is easy to do, but I try and think of it as the four A's, acknowledgement, allowance, acceptance, and attitude. You need to acknowledge and accept your life challenges are there for a reason. You may never discover what that reason is, you, but you need to answer that calling by taking responsibility for the choices you make. Responsibility means the ability to respond. You have to try and adopt an attitude that allows you to see the blessings that are hidden inside that challenge. If you follow these things through and open yourself up, hopefully this will help you on your healing journey so that you can rebuild from your losses. And I'm going to leave with one final quote from Edith Eager, whose book, The Choice, as I said before, I recommend you all out, in addition to buying my book, buy her book as well. This sums up my attitude. She writes, healing isn't about recovery. It's about discovery, discovering hope in hopelessness, discovering an answer when there doesn't seem to be one, discovering that it's not what happens that matters, it's what you do with it. Thank you very much, everyone. And I'm very happy now to answer any questions uh, for anybody who would like to put them in the chat. I don't know if anyone's put any questions in the chat. I'll leave yeah. that to you, Julie. Yeah, no, there aren't any questions at all, which leads me oh. to think that you've kind of answered all the questions that we might have on your amazing talk. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to answer. If you, if Neil, if you want to open up people's microphones, if anyone wants to make any comments or ask any questions directly, I'm very happy to do that now live. Uh, they just put their hand up if, if you're going to open up the microphones. Uh, whoever wants to open their microphone and I'm very happy to answer any questions or hear any comments from anyone. Everyone, everyone's happy with what I've said. I can't believe I haven't everyone's been controversial in any way. <laughs> Sylvie's got her hand up. Sylvie Bolag, I can see, is that waving? Or oh, she's just waving or oh, you want to say something? Can you unmute Sylvie? I don't know, Neil, if you... I wanted to say beautiful, but I, I didn't want to say, I just wanted to... Give you a sign it was very beautiful no, nothing thank you beautiful. sylvie and sylvie has been one of my angels i should have mentioned all through the years when i wasn't well sylvie is my neighbor in wickham road when i was living in wickham road and she was one of my neighbors she knows i'm into organic food as she is she would come round regularly with beautifully made fish meal for me and i cannot tell you how much i appreciated that sylvie these were all these angels who are around you when you're not well, this incredible support network. I'm so blessed to have family and friends and live in a community that was so supportive, you know, from the Rabonim, family, friends, neighbors, everybody. And even just people used to send me occasional texts, how am I doing? And I've had some wonderful responses to my book. I can see Anne on the, uh, on the, on the, on the video here. And I wanted, and I just had some lovely, lovely heartwarming messages from people who've read my book. And I always say, if in some small way, 
somebody, each person can take something away which will help them with whatever challenge they're going through. It was worthwhile all the months I spent writing the book, which was my therapy really at the end of the day. I think Leonard's Leonard. I just wanted to share something with you that I heard from Rav Moshe Shapiro, Mindy. First of all, I'm pleased to I love, thank you for your presentation. Um, he said sometimes in the Gemara it talks about so and so's opinion is aliba aliba rav or aliba so and so. But so he said, what does he mean aliba? He said it's from the heart. He said their opinion comes from the heart, and that ties in exactly what you said. It doesn't say that they said from their head. It says aliba so and so, and that means from their heart they said this. this so, I, it's amazing, You're, Leonard. I'm so pleased you brought that up. It's lovely to see you. Uh, I, I have to say, this is something that really spoke to me when the more I read about this, the more I went into it, there's an incredible organization called the Heart Math Institute, which teaches people who are going through challenges, resilience, and particularly children as well, which uses exercises to connect your brain and your heart together. And there's some meditations that I do from them and they have shown scientifically by connecting to your heart center that it actually raises the body's frequency to a healing frequency. They've, it's amazing because we always knew that love conquers all, but we could never, they could never prove this. They could never show this scientifically. Over the last 10 years, they have done an enormous amount of scientific uh, experiments, which now show that actually it's true. It's actually true. But the genetics themselves, genes are changed upgrade they've shown so many experiments where they go through it, certain things producing emotions of love which upgrade the genes that are deal with immunity in the body and people who are living lives in stress in constant stress it downgrades their genes which leads to lower immunity in the body anyway that that's just a side by the side but there's a, all the back of my the back of my book i give a big bibliography of a lot of the authors that i read which helped me through um lots of different uh, you know aspects of my healing um and if anyone who wants to read further about this and quantum physics is one of the areas which joe dispenser who's an amazing guy you can look up all on youtube um again at the back of my book i give the names of people uh, and they are all available. They all have videos on YouTube. If you're into that sort of area of looking at things, spiritually connecting with your heart and technically, scientifically, there is proven science now with all of this. It's not airy fairy stuff anymore. It's all provable science. Thank you, Mindy. Got any more, any more questions? Yeah, could I say to Mindy, Mindy is Kerry, I'm in Eretz Yisrael. Oh, it's a hush, snap. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. You should be in bed. And Mazal anyway. Tov to you, Terry, and you're up very late. Thank Terry's, you. And Terry's another one of my angels oh, who no, used to please. constantly send me messages how I'm oh. doing and always thinking of me. And, and again, all these incredible angels around I had in my life. Oh. Terry, I can't see you. You're probably in your no. PJs by now. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Mindy, I, I literally am in awe of you. That's not a fear. That is definitely through love. Love, um, yeah. yeah absolutely. Oh. But Thank I just want you, to Sarah. know, your personality, even prior to this, always led me to believe that you were that type of person anyway. Is that true? Or You know what, Terry, that's a very interesting thing. I, and I write this up in my book as well. Ironically, I used to be a very big warrior. I still am a warrior. I speak to my kids and my friends. Yeah. They all know I was always worrying that there's enough food when we went on picnics, beaches, wherever I was, I was always the one worrying about everybody else. But having said that, I come from a, a strong family of positive people. Mummy, my yeah. mother was the most positive person you could imagine. It was always a half gospel. She always saw the good in people, the mm. positive in the situation. She was always like that, despite the fact she came here as a kinder transport refugee, not knowing a word of English when she was 11 years old. And she built up a family. She married a Holocaust survivor. They brought uh, me and my two sisters up. And we were always a lovely, happy, healthy home that we were brought up in. And it was, it was from that and from the genes, I believe I've inherited 
I mean, the story of my grandmother is a story for another time, how she saved her husband from the Nazis. I come from a long line of very strong Rottenberg. Women. That was my grandmother's maiden name was Rottenberg. And my mother's cousins and everyone else, my aunt was very, very ill. Susie Bradfield was my aunt who's got the program is named oh, after SJS. She was very ill for the last 15, 20 years of her life, but she was incredibly positive, always go forward. And I believe if you can be born with positive genes, I believe I was, but that didn't discount the fact that I was also a warrior. I used to worry about everyone and everything and nature. It's part of his, you can try and change it. I've tried to change, but Terry, again, thank you. <laughs> Publicly, thank you for all your incredible support. Oh. Years. Thank you for and being here, Mindy. Kalto, thank you. Kalto. Thank you. Is anyone, does anybody else got any further comments or questions before I wrap up and give Mindy a massive thank you for such an amazing, an amazing talk? Okay, I think that's it then. If yeah, I think that's it. Thank say. you very, Thank very you, much, Mindy. Mindy. Thanks, First Cheryl. of all, for being so open and honest, which I, I, I can't even imagine how, I mean, I know you've done this now for a while, but how difficult it is. And I think we can truly learn from the advice that you've given us tonight, um, you know, trying to link, having healing coming through emotions of love and really trying to, to, to see the good things out of the hardships that we all face and let go of our fear to be able to love. So on that note, good night, everybody. And thank you again, Mindy. Really appreciate your pleasure. time. Thank you to everyone at NAIR for hosting me and to everybody who joined tonight. I really appreciate it. And uh, I send love to everybody. And then again, just to tell you, all the proceeds from the sale of the book are going to Emunah to help the children in Israel and Emunah. So I urge you, if you haven't bought the book already, do because it's also a donation to Tzedakah at the same time. So thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, thank you, thank Mindy. You, Julie, thank you, Neil and Louise and everybody at NAIR. Thank you very much for all the people who joined okay. as well. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night.